Seraphis and Jamtis today. The current uh, proposed upgrades to some core features in Monero. And the idea of this presentation is to give a high level overview of the changes that would impact users and what users should expect or would expect from what these upgrades would bring from a pretty high level. So it's not going to get too deep into the weeds of the technical issues. It's going to, I'm going to try and stay to the uh, level above, above water a bit. So, and this is also this is also the same presentation I gave at MoneroCon, but re-giving it just to uh, have the, the slides alongside the presentation as well, and uh, hopefully it could be uh, clear uh, as we go through this. So, the background and the basic impetus for Seraphis and how it came to be. So, there's a the way Monero works. The one of its core privacy properties is the way um, one of the, the few pil the three pillars of its privacy properties is uh, it's called ring signatures. So uh, ring signatures are used to provide sender privacy. So when I go and send somebody else some Monero, um, the way ring signatures work to ensure that my uh, transaction can't be linked or traced back to another transaction is that I will construct a ring signature which pulls from other transactions from across the blockchain that have happened in the past and references a set number of those. Today that number is 16, uh, well 15 others in each uh, input to a transaction. So that is essentially uh, one of Monero's core features to provide sender level privacy. and. So there's been continued research into how to increase that number from 16 to something potentially much larger and, and with still maintaining uh, a level of scalability and efficiency, efficiency that is acceptable. So Triptych was uh, one, one aspect of research that, or one research avenue that was taken back in, started began back in 2020 and 2021. And it found that we could support larger ring sizes, but unfortunately the implementation would end up with a multi-sig user experience that wasn't so great. So that effort kind of uh, subsided and died down. Now, Lelantis Spark was another back in 2021 that uh, Firo is uh, pushing forward at, at this point where you get nice properties of large ring sizes and nice multi-sig. Um, Seraphis was, is being was developed basically by uh, Co, a Monero focused researcher that also supports larger ring sizes, nice multi sig, and has a, a new multi uh, modular transaction protocol that's specifically built for Monero that also offers a host of new features that we'll get into later. And then Jamtis uh, came along a bit after Seraphis by uh, Tevador, who also uh, has implemented stuff for RandomX and uh, Polyseed in the past, different Monero um, features. And so Jamtis is a set of uh, well thought out upgrades to Monero's core features that can be supported alongside Seraphis and we'll get into those later as well. So here's an overview of the things that I'm gonna discuss. These eight things are not everything that are, is proposed in Seraphis or Jamtis. These are a slice of what I feel are, what I personally picked as uh, some of the, the biggest changes or the most important ones to highlight but there, there's still uh, more that, that are discussed, and this is just my own personal bias of which I felt were, were strongest to, to get into. So I'm gonna go into these one by one. So to start, the view balance key. So this is a private key that you could use to see all incoming as well as outgoing funds. So today in Monero, we have a view key and a spend key. The view key is only able today to see all incoming funds, but is not able to cryptographically determine outgoing funds. Uh, for that, you need the spend key, which is also used to spend your, your money. So the pros of having a view balance key. Now, it enables a fully featured and safer watch-only wallet. So today, if you want to have a wallet that can only see funds and not spend, 
um, what you have to do to to use that watch only wallet is continuously move to a, a, a signing device that has the spending your spend key on it generate key images on your spend only on your spend wallet so basically you have to load your 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 spend key into memory somewhere and use it in order to have your fully featured watch only wallet that is able to calculate your balance and is able to see outgoing funds so basically that that's a that's a bit of a, a safety concern anytime you have to load your your spend key somewhere that's some that's an attack surface and attack surface that opens up so a view balance key is something that enables you to have this watch only wallet that doesn't require a spend key to be used anywhere at all for the watch only wallet to be able to calculate your balance and function uh, fully featured now a view balance key also will improve all of the uh, signing experiences where there are multiple signing devices. That includes offline cold signing, um, where you might have your watch only wallet somewhere, and then your an, an offline an offline device where you use to set, sign your transactions. Uh, it includes a hardware wallet, which is your the signing device as well, and it includes a multi sig wallet where you have multiple participants who could be signing from different locations of different wallets. Um, so. The way that a view balance key will improve the experience uh, for each of these is that, again, it's this it's this caveat where each device, each sign, each signing device needs the, to to be sending these key images across across the device. So, for example, you're you're one participant in a multisig, you're one of three, and you need to know which funds have already been spent in the multisig wallet, and you need to know what your balance is. You want to know what your balance is, so. The multi-sig experience today functions where you have to do rounds of communication with the all other multi-sig participants where you're sharing information, the key images that allows you to determine what the outgoing funds are and what the balance, what your balance is, as, as what outputs are allowed to be signed and how to construct transactions in the future. Essentially, there, you, you require these continuous rounds of communication that can be done away with with a view balance key so that each, each user knows what has been spent in the wallet um, without additional communication. So, and the same goes for your offline wallet, your, your signing experience there, and a, and a hardware wallet has to exchange less information between device and, and machine where your wallet is located. Um, so this, this, gen this experience gets improved by the existence of the view balance key. Now, one controversial aspect with this view balance key is that um, there is now this additional key that, if given up, has more cryptographic information about your your Monero transaction history, which is a concern. People have expressed concern over this. Now, that we'll get it. I'll get into it more in the cons. But it's it's important to recognize that today, with today's view key, it already is possible to determine and make very very strong educated guesses as to which what outgoing funds are a user's. You can't make cryptographic guesses with cryptographic certainty. So it's not like we can design watch only wallets that are fully featured that are have the perfect user experience that are making these guesses. Um, but someone doing surveillance or someone who has access to a view key, it can make very, very, very strong guesses as to what's what funds are spent by the user just with today's view key. So that's something important to note and, and to keep in mind when, when thinking of the privacy properties of a view balance key and what it would enable beyond today's view key. Um, and then finally, I'll get into uh, light wallets with stronger privacy properties. And, and this, this is just a, a separate, separate detail that uh, is also a mitigating factor of collecting view keys and all that. We'll get, we'll get into this, this pro later on. So the con of a view balance key, getting into this a bit deeper. So, once ring size is due and after ring size is due, already increase a significant amount. So this is in some future hypothetical, provided that the update of Seraphis goes through. Um, once this occurs and once we do have larger ring sizes, then you could argue that a view balance key at that point can be a more powerful surveillance tool than a view key that can only see incoming funds. Because then at that point, guessing, making very, very strong, educated and correct guesses as to what a user's balance is, as to what their outgoing funds are, becomes more difficult to do. 
Um, so at that point, then you could say the view balance key is worse than a view key. Now, there are two there are two potential outcomes that that could arise that that are the the highly negatives of of what the view balance key enables. I would say. Um, first is let's say powers that be mandate sharing view balance keys or to use an exchange you have to share your view balance key or to use this regulated service you have to share your view balance key now that is that is a concern something to be concerned about for sure but it should also be kept in mind that that can already be that that that, that avenue is already available today where users can already be compelled to give up their their view key today as well as all their signed key images which then it's which then show what their outgoing funds are. So what a user's outgoing funds already are co completely with crypto back of certainty. So essentially, if you say, if we say that the powers that be will start requiring giving up view balance keys, there's, there's not much reason to think that they wouldn't also do the same for users today of having to give up view keys inside Kimichi key images today, which they don't. So it's just, it's, it's something to keep in mind of, uh, do the V balance keys do certainly enable greater power and to, to that level that that is something to be concerned about? It's, it's tough to say. Um, and then the second outcome there is a centralized wallet service that set that may collect these view balance keys so that users get instant wallet loading. Um, now, that is another another thing that is mitigated that I'll talk about in the next section that hopefully there's this will be this new tier that's that Seraphis and Jamfis offer where um, the centralized wallet service will be able to offer instant wallet loading without necessarily without needing to get the view balance keys. So we'll get into that next as well. So light wallets with stronger privacy privacy are also enabled by um, Jamfis. So in Monero. Um, in order to determine which transactions belong to you, your wallet has to scan the entire blockchain from the last time it was open to try and decrypt every single transaction to see which ones are yours and which ones, which transactions were received to you and spent by you in the chain. And so if you haven't used your wallet in a while, this can be pretty slow. Um, depend, it just depends on how the last time you used your wallet. So what light wallets do is they offload the scanning to a separate device. So what you could do is you have your phone that functions as a light wallet, a light mobile wallet, and then at your home, you could be running uh, alongside your node a, a server a, it's called the light wallet server that's continuously scanning the chain for your transactions. And so that when you open up your light wallet, it will point to your server at home that is continuously scanning the chain and will instantly load and you'll be able to instantly use the device and spend without having to wait for it to scan the chain. So there are some open source implementations of the Light Wallet server. Monero LWS is one by VT Nerd, and then Open Monero by Monero Example is another. And essentially the way the Light Wallets work is they have your view key on them. They're stored a view key on their device and on the device. And so it uses that to identify all of the received outputs, uh, all the transactions where the user received Monero, and it can also see the amounts in those transactions. So the proposed upgrade for light wallets is that you can have a server that one, can't tell any amounts uh, that are received in transactions or spent, and can't definitively identify which outputs are a user's. And in Seraphis, um, the terminology is, the proposed terminology for outputs is enotes. And that's what we've been using uh, to describe them. So basically, so long as a user doesn't reuse an address to receive Monero, the server isn't able to tell. So there's this, there's this caveat, this caveat in the light wallet tier where the server is able to identify received outputs but only if the user doesn't reuse an address. So this is still a work in progress to mention. Um, and so more feedback uh, along is, is definitely uh, appreciated and warranted and and uh would like to get more people chiming in on on this uh on this on this tier as well so getting deeper into the pros and cons so again the idea is that with this light wallet server you'll get the same exact user experience of instant wallet loading 
instant usage. As soon as you open your mobile wallet or your phone, you're, it's ready to go uh, with that gain in privacy where the server can't tell anything uh, or can't tell the amounts and received outputs definitively. So this also poses the threat that a large centralized light wallet server could pose to the anonymity set. So uh, for example, today we have um, my Monero, which is hosting a server, which is has access to a number of users' view keys, which can see and identify transactions that belong to the user, and um, it guesses as to their spends. Now, the way Monero works is that we have a, a large anonymity set where when I construct a transaction, I'm referencing other people's transactions from across the chain um, in constructing my rig signature to ensure that nobody looking at my transaction can be able to tell which one is the one that I'm, which Monero I'm spending in my transaction. Now, if there was some huge party that knows a, a, huge, a large percentage of the spends that have occurred on chain and can build this, this graph of trans, this transaction links to this one. And, and so if this person tr tries to reference this other one, we can eliminate it and we know that that's not the case. So essentially that's, it reduces the anonymity set when you have a large party that knows uh, which spends and receives belong to users. So if you can, if we can create a light wallet server where the light wallet server has limited visibility into how users are spending and has limited information, less, less information to be able to definitively tell what linkages there are among users and among transactions that reduces that light wallet server's capacity to reduce the, the size of the anonymity set. So there's another, another con here with this tier. So, and then finally, um, I'm personally extremely, very, very excited about this tier because I like this idea of being able to run this light wallet server at home, not just for me, but for family and friends as well, to where you can have this, this model of, uh, the Uncle Jim. So uh, credit to Diverter no KYC on Twitter, who gave a presentation at um, Guns and Bitcoin and brought this brought this up. Um, so the idea is with Uncle Jim is that you have somebody within your community, someone within your, your close knit group who is running the infrastructure, who has the technical knowledge to be able to host a node, host a server alongside that node and run it. And then the people close to that person um, close to the Uncle Jim can just point their wallets to that server. So this this idea, I think, is is a powerful one toward towards scaling uh, de the decentralization and uh, of of Monero essentially. And I I, I think that uh, that is is an avenue towards getting like the optimal UX into the most people's hands. Um, so now the cons the cons with um, this light wallet tier. So First off, that I mentioned earlier, if a user reuses an address, they are revealing to the server which e notes belong to or received to that address. So that's that's a it's a pretty significant con because I mean one of one of Monero's core privacy properties, one of the, one of its pillars, is this thing called the stealth address, where I can put my self address anywhere in the internet, and uh, if I, I can accept donations to it, for example, and if I receive any any Transact anytime someone sends Monero to to that self address, nobody can tell on chain which that I'm the one receiving that Monero. So that's the, the a huge benefit of stealth addresses that is uh, pretty much done away with with this light wallet tier um, because the light wallet server is then able to tell. Now it, it doesn't go on chain; it, it's revealing that information to the light wallet server. Uh, and then there's also another pretty very significant caveat, which is that time analysis is likely it, it it is likely able to make good guesses as to the spends and receives. Now, not definitive guesses, but it's probable it's probably the case that a server that is keeping track of all interactions to with to and from the server with all users and collecting all the information on of people accessing the server will be able to still make make guesses as to linkages between transactions. Now they won't be perfect, they won't be cryptographically certain, but the guesses are still plausible, which is why it would still be, I would still recommend very strongly that you run your own light wallet server if you're technically capable and that that's still the ideal to shoot for to have 
everybody running their own and everybody running their own node. Um, but so it, but, and so this is just, this is just an extra caveat to keep in mind with this tier. And then final con is that if you'd receive two plus enotes in a transaction, it also enables the server to easily identify that those enotes belong to the user. And there are possible ways around this and to, to mitigate this downside and possibly eliminate it. But it's something that to keep in mind, especially um, with another idea that is on the table uh, and something in consideration where you could have transactions where users receive many e-notes in a single transaction or today outputs in a transaction um, so that they're easily able to spend them um, even if they have a, a small transaction in the future. So get it into this little little UX pin pinpoint of, of Monero. So when I receive some Monero, I have to wait 10 blocks in order to spend that Monero. Let's say I only have one Monero. I've only ever received one Monero in my wallet. I then go and spend it in the future. I have to wait these 10 blocks. Now, let's say I had divided receipt of this, of this one Monero into multiple e-notes or outputs into 16, for example, which is a feature some wallets currently support. Um, it's called pocket change, I believe, and um, Nereo uh, and Kick Wallet as well supports the feature. So essentially, this would enable me to spend some of the e-notes and then keep the others available for spending. So this caveat within the light wallet tier would essentially offer a, a worse a, a disadvantage for users um, because the server is still able to tell that those now e-notes belong to the user. Um, so just something to keep in mind of, of this tier as well. So another thing to discuss, uh, third point, new addresses. So because we're, because the move is towards larger rings, just the, there, there is no inevitable, there's no way to construct the images. There's essentially no, no path forward that would enable us to upgrade without migrating to new addresses. Now, what this means for users. So no users would need to create a new seed. All old seeds, existing seeds would work completely fine. Um, so that's just one thing to start. Funds received in the past to any old address would always be spendable. So any Monero received in the past is completely spendable without, without any concern. The only change, the biggest change is that any funds sent in the future after the upgrade would need to be sent to a completely new address. So that's, that's, the, the, that's the fundamental expectation uh, that users should expect. And so this isn't completely settled yet. Addresses are not set in stone completely. There's still some, a few things that are being hashed out and discussed that would impact how exactly what the addresses would look like. But this is the general, the general gist in, of, of, what they, of what they look like. So the, on the left, you have the old address scheme, uh, which you can see is basically you have some capital letters in there. And then on the right, you have a much longer address um, it includes an additional public key, uh, and it's also in base 32, which makes it, which is all lowercase, as you can see, easier to read and easier to copy. Um, Size-wise, that's about the general size difference, not the, the exact, but that's about what to expect in the, in the new address compared to the old. So, service now, because, because we're going to have to move to, we would have to move to new addresses. Uh, as part of this upgrade, it presents this unique opportunity um, where we can create a new address scheme that takes all this feedback that users have expressed over the years and pinpoint pain points that users have experienced and complained about um, and trying to design an address scheme that's, that's robust, that basically simplifies and solves all those issues that people have experienced in the past. And so Jamtis is essentially seizing this opportunity, and that's that was the the idea behind the idea driving Tevador towards uh, a lot of the upgrades and most of the upgrades that are that are proposed in Jamtis. So first off, there's a simplified address scheme. So today in Monero, there there are three main address types. You have your standard address, the one that starts with a four, that is the default wallet address, and then there are sub addresses. Um, and sub addresses basically allow you to have one wallet where you can dish out new sub addresses to different counterparties. So let's say you go to Merchant A, um, or you're you're you said you want to receive or 
withdraw from an exchange and um, you don't want to link the address that you've received from, from the exchange to some other party who's also going to send you some Monero. So you would generate a new sub address. And so that sub address can't be tied to the other. And you could just use one wallet to house these different addresses. That's the, uh, that's the essential idea behind sub addresses. Um, and then you have integrate, we have integrated addresses where you have an address and then uh, concatenated with a payment ID at the end of it. And what this enables is merchants to embed these unique payment identifiers at the end of an address to um, handle order fulfillment, to tie to the payment to a particular order, uh, while also having a single address that's prepended in front of the payment ID that users can trust that they're sending to the, the same exact merchant that they had been using in the past. So what Jamtis proposes is limiting the, the difference between standard and sub addresses in favor of a single Jamtis address, and then replacing integrated addresses with had, which have a whole set of problems that I'll discuss later on uh, with certified addresses. We'll, and we'll get into these in a bit. So problems today with sub addresses. So first, which is probably, probably the most significant, is that it's vulnerable to an attack called the Janus attack. And what that attack enables is um, someone who might know that you you might or have a sus a suspicion that you own a particular sub address um, if they're sending you some error in the future they can construct the transaction in a way where if you confirm receipt of that monero you would be giving up the information that you own a particular sub address without knowing that you just gave up that information so it's a pretty significant attack on sub addresses that is undetectable that um, is a, a, an issue that, that would be patched and fixed um, with this upgrade. So other issues with sub addresses. Generating sub addresses requires keeping track of the ones already provisioned. Now, and this is also related to this next point of recovering funds received to sub addresses automatically um, is not robust. So essentially the way sub addresses work today is that you have to increment, like let's say you want to receive to sub addresses your first sub address, that's sub address zero, your second sub address, that's sub address one, your third sub address, sub address two. So you're incrementing in that way to generate new addresses. Now, that means that let's say you have one device that has generated some of the sub, a sub address over here for the, the other one, if, if the other one doesn't know that's been, been generated, you have another wallet and another machine, uh, you, you can't, there's no communication across the devices by default that makes sure that they've already provisioned, which is an issue. And, and so you have to be able to tell that, and you have to be keeping track of which ones you've already given out so that you don't end up reusing one. Now, there's also this issue that recovering them is not automatically robust because we can't, we can't exactly tell. Let's say a user generates 3,000 sub addresses um, and then generates a sub addresses that, that's like, really, really far out. Let's say they just randomly decide to generate a sub address at 5,000, like the index number 5,000. Uh, the way the wallet recovers funds sent to sub addresses today is what's called a look ahead. It'll look at the first um, thousands of sub addresses that have been generated uh, and it generates those thousands. And if there is one sub address which has received Monero outside of that, that range, um, then the wallet isn't by default able to detect that funds were received to that sub address. And users have run into issues where they weren't, they weren't able to recover funds sent to the sub address. And so that's just, that's just been an issue that, that people have experienced and run into. Um, now there are transactions. Another, another caveat and issue with sub addresses is that when you have a transaction that has three plus outputs and it uses sub addresses, um, that's identifiable as such on chain, meaning that you can tell that this this user used sub addresses in this transaction because there are three plus outputs, and so because there were three plus outputs, you could and and because the way sub addresses work, you could then see information on chain that gives up that okay sub addresses were used in that transaction, um, and then finally they take extra development to support and they increase the, the complexity of the protocol. And there are some wallets today that still don't implement sub addresses. Uh, just because of this extra development that they take to support. So, and we've got, we've got some more. So generally the best practice 
is to use a new sub address with every counterparty. Meaning that if you're if you're receiving Monero from different different people, you don't want to be giving up that you own one address, and you you don't want to be giving up information to counterparties who can collude to then see, okay, this person received to this address. We know these two transactions belong to them because they they use the same address for both of those. Now, even though the information doesn't go on chain because of stealth addresses and how Monero works, that information is still um, a bit of a privacy, something that you're giving up by not using sub addresses across different counterparties. Um, and now I'd say that I'd also say the existence of the standard address, which is like the default generate primary address, detracts from this because it's in some way a tacit encouragement to use that primary address and to use the standard that, that your wallet loads with. Additionally, let's say you're using a standard address um, across two different wallets you have ge you've generated two different wallets and you give out the standard address to two different people though you're two different ones they would both be able to tell you're using a different wallet and you've created a new wallet which is which is a bit of metadata there's not not a whole lot someone can do with that information but it's just something that you're giving up because the standard address is identifiable to one to one wallet there's only one per wallet um, and then there's just this general choice that it places on users of, should I use a sub address? Should I stick with a standard? I don't know. And there's, there's here, there's a, a relevant XKCD where you have one person saying, where if we steal one of those cars, we can get to the base and defuse the bomb. Hmm, the one on the left accelerates faster, but has a lower top speed. Ooh, the right one has good contraction control. Are the roads wet? <laughs> and then pro tip, if you ever need to defeat me, just give me two very similar options and unlimited inter internet access. Now. This choice to use a sub address versus standard address, it's not like, there's still pretty similar options and it's just, uh, it's just a, a, a thing that's thrust onto a user to think and decide, should I be using the sub address here? Should I be using the standard? Like what, what should I be doing in this circumstance? Uh, and, and it's just, a, it's just an extra US, UX thing that's, uh, that really shouldn't, shouldn't need to be there. So the idea with Jamtis is to have a single primary address, no, I mean a single, method of generating addresses that each one is not distinguishable from the other. So there's no more idea of this one primary standard address. Um, there's just basically Jamtis addresses. And another huge benefit um, that is you'd be able to generate Jamtis addresses randomly and offline. Um, and so the, these address indexes as part of the Jamtis proposal is to use um, use 16 byte address ind indexes, which would support uh, UUIDs as well for merchant systems that want to use them. Um, but essentially it has enough bit space to support random address generation so that cross devices and cross wallets, there needs to be no uh, keeping track of which one was generated on that incremented step. So it's just each wallet can randomly generate it and it's good to go. Good to use that address. Um, and there's also no need for a look ahead where, where you have the wallet has to generate this thousands number of, of sub addresses and then keep them in memory and check which which funds receive and belong uh, uh, were, were received to these this range of sub addresses um, rather than needing to keep that look ahead, which has resulted in users who might have funds and receive Monero to sub addresses farther out of that range, uh, losing or not seeing that those are recoverable. Um, Essentially, in Jamtis, you could simply decrypt uh, which which um, sub which address received which Monero uh, in real time, right on the spot. So there's no look ahead. It's you'll know exactly which one received which which address received which which transaction. Uh, and then they mitigate Jamtis addresses also mitigate the Janus attack, which is just a, a vulnerability currently present in sub addresses, as mentioned earlier. And then. Finally, the, the single, the fact that there is just this single Jamtis address type should mean that it's easier to develop for once a wallet supports the Jamtis address, it's done and there's no, there's no need for extra support um, to ensure that the wallet is supporting addresses in the same way as other wallets. That's, that's the, the basic premise and idea. Certified addresses. So again there was the, the today we, there's this uh, this idea of the integrated address and those are useful for merchants who want unique payment identifiers for each order um, when you're selling a particular good you generate a unique payment id tack it onto the address um, 
this and tack it onto the static address that your repeat customers can look to and see. Now there's problems with integrate or integrated addresses today. First is you can't send to more than one integrated address in a single transaction. It's not possible. So if you want to send to multiple parties or multiple multiple integrated addresses, you're out of luck. You'd have to create multiple transactions, which which is just a pain to deal with. It can be a pain. Um, and you also have this this thing where all transactions have an eight byte payment identifier on chain, which is just an extra eight bytes that all transactions now support with dummy payment identifiers, which is just a bloat that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Um, and then you can go and also read uh, this proposal that, that covers that covers these downsides uh, at this link here, where it's there's there's a bit, basically a, a pretty big push to deprecate integrated addresses because of these issues. Um, now, certified addresses uh, are a solution in that they're unique. They you're, they able they enable you to generate unique generated addresses, unique Jamtis addresses. So that same that same single type of a Jamtis address um, that are then signed by a single private key. They're just digitally signed um, as Jamtis addresses essentially, and then. What users can do is they add a merchant's RID, a recipient identifier, to an address book where they'll know for sure that once they have added this merchant's essential, that once they've added the merchant's fingerprint, they'll know that any, any payment sent to the merchant in the future that comes from, that's signed by the, the certified address comes signed with that exact key that they have in their address book, they'll know for certain that they're sending to the, to the correct address. And there's no there's no risk of some sort of man in the middle attack where uh, the address can be modified or changed in any way. It's signed by a known address. So getting into this notion of recipient identifiers. So there's just this general problem of copy pasting and then visually looking at an address to see oh are these characters exactly correct? It's it's a nerve wracking it could be a nerve wracking process that it's just uh, not a not a not a not particularly enjoyable, and um, larger addresses will make that a bit worse. Um, so the solution there is this thing called a recipient identifier, where you take a hash of the larger address and you get this, this string here in orange that's a lot smaller, easier to compare. And so what the user would be expected to do is they see on their wallet, um, that recipient identifier at the bottom matches up with what's displayed on the merchant interface on the point of sale system. And that's the idea with uh, recipient identifiers. The generate address key. So today there are some problems um, with generating addresses. So let's say you have a merchant system that wants to generate new addresses and accept funds to new new addresses. What that requires is a server somewhere that has access to a user's private view key, uh, which and that key is able to see all in incoming received funds. Now. Also, another additional problem is that integrated addresses, while integrated addresses don't need the private view key, they have their own set of problems, which were uh, mentioned earlier. So the solution here with Jamtis is a new generate address key that's specifically made that all it can do is generate Jamtis addresses, and that's it. It's just one key purpose built for that. You can have a system that, that only houses this key that's there just to generate new addresses. Doesn't need any other additional, any other private view key or anything like that. Um, now, transaction chaining is another another uh, key feature of Seraphis. So, the problem some problems today that transaction chaining solves. So, it's currently impossible to pre-sign a transaction, uh, meaning that let's say I want to construct a transaction today that spends from a transaction. So, I want to construct a transaction A, and then I want to construct a transaction B that spends from transaction A suspends the Monero that is sent in transaction A. And I want to do this and construct both at the same time before submitting them to the blockchain. So we can't, that's, that's just impossible to do today. And without this, without this feature, um, atomic swaps only work where Bitcoin or Ethereum move first in the transaction. Um, and it's just the, the way the atomic swap protocol currently works. And it's just one limitation and, and hurdle to get over that is, uh, that's tricky. And what transaction chaining enables is this, this feature that's exactly needed to enable Bitcoin to move first. So that's one, that's one pre, like pre core feature of Seraphis that is enabled, especially by the, the, mon, the modular transaction protocol that uh, would be nice. 
And then also there was a question uh, in my, when I gave the presentation of Monericon from Arctic Mine uh, regarding transaction chaining and if it would enable um, something similar to uh, Bitcoin's child pays for parents. Um, and it's not exactly the case. Um, it, it wouldn't, it's, there are caveats with child pays for parent that aren't exactly solved by transaction chaining. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that because I think I, I gave an answer that wasn't exactly uh, uh, perfect towards that. So just clarifying that information. So thank you uh, for listening. If anyone's made it this far. Um, and again, so feedback is definitely, definitely, definitely encouraged, welcome, especially merchants, uh, anyone who's using Monero, uh, any, any, any UX pain points or things that are identified in Jamtis and Seraphis that um, are, are some things that you like or don't like, that feedback is more than welcome. Um, here are a couple links and uh, matrix channels, and I haven't updated this uh, presentation, but there are, there are some more links that I'd, I'd like to share and include. Um, there is a no wallet left behind matrix channel that I'm, I'm going to throw up wherever this presentation is posted. We'll I'll include a link to that. Uh, and then as well as a, a repository um, where that is housing uh, the effort towards the migration and that is basically detailing tons of issues that um, are, be, are coming to light. And, and that effort is, is being coordinated by Renee Bunner uh, as well. So that that's another place to go look to and, and see uh, see how the de how development is flowing on this front. So we'll include, make sure to include those links wherever this, this is shared. Uh, no, no questions, actually. So. Thank you. Thank you for listening in.